you all for joining us for worship this morning here in the sanctuary and online. There will be a safe sanctuary training session today following the worship service at 1115 here in the sanctuary. This training is required in order to work with our children's program. If you have any questions, please see Diane Broadwater. This Saturday from 5 to 7 p.m., we will be having our Fall Fest. It's a free event and we have many activities planned. There will be a hayride to a pumpkin patch, crafts, games, food, good fellowship with our community. The newsletter date line is next Monday, October the 21st by 11 a.m. This newsletter contains all of the activities for November and December. If your group has any Thanksgiving or Christmas related activities that you would like the church to know about, please get the information to David by next Monday. Monday. I also like you to uh, notice in your bulletin, you had the slip for the homemade apple pies. Remember this, fill it out and order your pies when they start to bake them in another week or so. And don't forget about the food we need collected for our Christmas baskets. Are there any other announcements that anybody wants to make at this time? Okay. <laughs> about the apple pies, um, we still need people to sign up to make the pie balls. So if anybody wants to do that, that'd be great. And just so you know, apple pies are not a girl's sport. So all you guys out there, you can come out and help cut the apples, peel the apples. And you can even bake the apples. We will have a special way for everybody that wants to come out. <laughs> Did you all hear that? He said that making apple pies are no longer a girl's sport. So you guys can step up a little bit to help him out. Anybody else? Suzanne? I do. Uh, choir practice uh, is tomorrow night at 6. And I got the Christmas cantata there. So we're going to start Christmas cantata practice tomorrow evening. I know I've had several people that tell me whether to join the choir for uh, the Christmas cantata. It's called the Rose of Bethlehem. And I had the book this morning. If you want to see me right after the church, Okay, and I'll start again. The reason this isn't Matt Cole up here, who is my son, he's not feeling well. He has the flu or something. So I'm substituting for Matt. And we'll start with the birthdays this week. On the 13th, we have Logan Davis and Layla Lawn. On the 16th, we have Kendra Avey Montgomery. And the 19th, Paul Bosberg. I see Paul is here. Happy birthday, Paul. The altar flowers are given to the glory of God in memory of Ken Burkall by Jean Burkall. Now let us prepare our hearts to worship and celebrate God our creator with the musical prelude.
Now will you all stand for the call to worship? In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. Rejoice in the Lord, O oh, your righteous, and give thanks to God's holy name. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and great is to be praised, and God's greatness to be honored. Now we will have our hymn of praise, Breathe on Me, Breath of God. It's on 420 in your book or on the screen. be seated. We'll have our opening prayer. O oh God, in mystery and silence, you are present in our lives, bringing new life out of destruction, hope out of despair, growth out of difficulty. We thank you that you do not leave us alone, but labor to make us whole. Help us to perceive your unseen hand in the unfolding of our lives, and to attend to the gentle guidance of your spirit, that we may know the joy you give your people. Amen. Now our prayer of confession. God of grace and glory, we thank you. Judge us not by the perfection of our actions, but by our readiness to live boldly by faith. Help us as individuals and as a con congregation to trust you and follow where you lead, that in Christ your name may be glorified in all the earth. Amen. Now join me in the prayer for illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy to us today. Amen. Now our epistle reading is from Hebrews chapter 4 verses 12 through 16. Indeed the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart and before him no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. Since then, we have a, high, a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession, for we do not have a high priest 
who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. May you be blessed in hearing this holy word. Thanks be to God. And now we will have the anthem by the choir. Okay, I've just been told at this time we will not have a children's message and we have no children to invite them to go to children's church. That's much to our <laughs> takes care of that. So now I would like to introduce to you our guest speaker, Mr. Clifton Brooks. I guess you all have noticed that I am not Pastor Cloakley. <laughs> I was asked to fill in for him and I gladly accepted and I'm um, glad to be here this morning. And now we'll have our gospel reading, which is from Ephesians 6 verses 10 through 17. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God, so that you may be able to stand against the vows of the devil. For our struggle is not against blood and flesh, but against the rulers, 
against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand on the evil day and having prevailed against everything to stand firm. Stand, therefore, and belt your waist with truth and put on the breastplate of righteousness and lace up your sandals in preparation for the gospel of peace. With all these, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. May you be blessed in the hearing of this holy word. And now if you'll stand for the hymn of preparation, take up thy cross on the hymnal on 415 or on the screen. be seated. Now at this time we're going to ask for prayers of the people, your joys and concerns. Would you talk a little loud so that we can keep track of this so Anne can get it in her little notes to everybody. So how about your joys or concerns? Anybody? I have a joy. <laughs> okay, Ginger. I have a joy that Thank you, Ginger. They were in Kentucky, and they worked on six sites in case you didn't hear it. That's great. Okay.
children. Thank you. And in case you don't know, this is uh, Pastor, I mean, Mr. Brooks's wife, and she's thanking all of us. That's very nice. Thank you. Any more? Over there? Yes, you. Thank you. Susan. So, would you all bow your heads then and we'll say a, a prayer for everything that people have discussed and brought to our attention. Dear God, please keep in mind all the things that the people in our congregation have brought before you to consider. Help those who need help and comfort those who at this time need your comfort. In doing, to finish this prayer out, we would we will uh, do the prayer that our Father brought to us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. Forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Now at this time we will have our sharing of the peace. You can stand up and drink. No, it's not yet. Yeah. It's not on ours yet. Well, hold on a minute. We're just having a... Did I miss something? <laughs> oh, I did. I am so sorry. <laughs> oh, well. Us new people, sometimes we just... I was writing all over where he was at, and I'm sorry. <laughs> so... We did that and did that. So now, let's welcome our guest speaker, Mr. Clifton Brooks. Well, good morning again. <laughs> you know, nothing ever goes as planned. <laughs> we all know that. So, but we swing around and pick it up. So we're good. <laughs> When I was asked to um, be here, I start looking for a sermon, and as I was looking and trying to figure out what I wanted to talk this morning, uh, word kept coming in my head, you need to do the sermon you did in the spring. You need to bring that one back up. So it was like, well, I guess that's what I'm supposed to do. So we will be doing our sermon title, Put Your Armor On. Now, if you'll pray with me. Heavenly Father, let these be your words and not mine. Let them fall on a listening heart, a listening ear, and an accepting heart. Amen. Now, this sermon I borrowed from a um, preacher, Bryce Morgan. And I, when I first saw it, I said that seemed to be a fitting title and sermon for what is going on today. So on February 28th, <clears throat> four days into the Russian invasion of Ukraine, a British television crew came under fire after a while driving about 30 kilometers from Kyiv. They had been told the area into which they were traveling was quiet, but things had clearly changed. As one of the journals reported, from being a quiet location, the whole of this part of the countryside, including our intended de destination, had turned into a battlefield. After turning around and heading back to the city down a different road, their car suddenly came under attack from what was believed to be a Russian reconnaissance squad. Even though their car was pounded by enemy gunfire, all five members of the team were able to get out and scramble over a concrete barrier to safety. But the correspondent, Stuart Ramsey, had been shot twice in the back. But in the end, he was just fined. And how is that possible? Two words, body armor. As we turn once again to God's word this morning, we discover a similar reminder about the importance of armor for each one of us. And let us consider that reminder as we turn back to Ephesians 6. As we move toward the conclusion of Paul's letter to the followers of Jesus in the ancient city of Ephesus, listen to how he encouraged his readers. 
And this was from verses 10 through 17, which we will recount. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the sword of God. What is the apostle describing here? He's describing life on the battlefield, conflict, forces of evil, putting on armor. This is the language of warfare, of a battle taking place in which the Ephesian Christians are involved. And if we believe their faith is our faith, and that this was and is God's word to his people, then we are on that same battlefield. So to better understand and faithfully apply this passage, let's think more carefully about three elements God has revealed here through Paul. First, our enemies in the battle. Second, our goal in the battle, and third, our protection in the battle. So notice, if you haven't already, that Paul wastes no time in identifying our common enemy on this battlefield. In verse 11, put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. But he doesn't stop there. In verse 12, he provides us with a rich description of an entire movement or system of complex of evil that is working to extend this present darkness of evil. We read about rulers, about authorities, about powers, and about spiritual forces. Now it's important to grasp both the emphasis and contrast here. There is clearly an emphasis on the power of our opponents. But we also see that Paul's presenting a clear contrast between on one hand flesh and blood, opposition, and on the other hand those cosmic and spiritual enemies in the heavenly spaces. Why this emphasis? Why this contrast? Because our tendency is focused on our everyday circumstances and our everyday obstacles and our everyday antagonist. And in so doing so, we miss the fact that larger forces are at work behind the scenes. The devil is not indifferent toward us. He is scheming. And he is not alone in carrying out these schemes. He has a network of evil, one embedded deeply in the power structures of this world. That's why words like rulers, authorities, and powers are also used in the New Testament to talk about human governments. So what is the goal of these schemes? While this passage doesn't explicitly spell out the goal of these demonic schemes, 
I think we can understand him from Paul's emphasis and our goal in this battle. Notice that even though Paul is painting a picture of what some have called spiritual warfare, there is nothing overly tactically offensive about his encouragements. We are not called to advance. We are not called to take the hill. We are not called to send saboteurs to blow up the enemy's strongholds. We are not called to push back the front lines or take spiritual prisoners or cut off supply lines. We are called to do three times in four verses, Paul is crystal clear. Stand against the scheme of the devil. Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand or stand in opposition in the evil day. Having done it all to stand firm. And again in verse 14, stand therefore. While some in recent times have developed fanciful versions of the spiritual warfare and imaginative demonized systems that often have more in common with occultism than the Bible. The word of God itself reminds us that the true spiritual warfare is first and foremost about standing our ground in the gospel, the good news of Jesus. Consider this example from the same letter as we look back at verse 4, or chapter 4, verses 26 and 27. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And give no opportunity to the devil. How is the devil scheming in this scenario? He's looking to gain a foothold through the unresolved anger in the body of Christ. The content in chapter 4 makes it clear that Paul is talking about our life together as God's people. And our life together should be grounded in the gospel of peace. As we drop down a few verses where Paul writes in chapter 4 verse 32, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. As God in Christ forgave you. What is the devil's goal? How are these spiritual forces of evil attacking us? By seeking to move away from the gospel, the very thing that unites us. They seek to use these things like unresolved anger to keep us focused on ourselves and divided as a faith family. This also applies to our lives as the church scattered. If Jesus Christ has already won the war, and the gospel is the proclamation of his triumph, then fundamentally, the most strategic thing we can do in our battles is to simply stand firm in our faith, and in doing so, embody and reflect the greatness of his victory. And how about our protection? So how can we stand firm in the light of daily attacks from these numerous and powerful spiritual enemies. We can put on the armor of God. Not just some of it, but the whole armor of God. And what exactly does that mean? Well, notice the elements that Paul is highlighting here. How is the highlight, how is he highlighting them? by creatively comparing them to the different pieces of armor that a soldier might wear 
in an early battle, or earthly battle. So when he talks about a soldier's belt, or breastplate, or shoes, or shield, or helmet, or sword, he's really talking about truth and righteousness, the gospel of peace, faith, salvation, and the word of God. What should be striking about these elements is just how familiar they are in light of everything we've seen so far in this letter. Paul is not introducing here some secret knowledge about spiritual war warfare. He is, therefore, at the conclusion, simply repackaging everything he's already been telling them throughout this letter. Now we have to be careful with this armor imagery not to get bogged down in minutes, that is, and how each piece of armor works in light of the comparisons presented here. The point instead is the very point emphasized in the very first verse of this passage in verse 10. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. There's our armor. That's our protection. It's what Paul called in, verse, in chapter 1, verse 19, the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe. You see, to put on the whole armor of God is not a magical or mystical, mystical practice that results in supernatural protection. It is a gospel practice that rehearses and is reassured by the supernatural protection we already have in Jesus. Let us unpack that idea by first rehearsing again the elements Paul lists in verses 14 through 18. Truth, righteousness, the gospel of peace, faith, salvation, and the word of God. Now, in light of those, listen to some key verses from the previous chapters. Paul reminds us of them in, verse, in chapter 1, verse 13. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. He emphasizes the same reality in, in chapter 2, verse 8. For by the grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. He goes on to talk about the community implications of this gospel in chapter 2, verse 14. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. And in chapter 3, verse 6, he summarized these community implications. The mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and the partakers of the promise of Christ Jesus through the gospel. And he drives home the reassuring results of this in chapter 3, verses 11 to 12. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. You see, he wants them to remember the way you learn Christ then in assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through the deceitful desires, 
and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Is putting on the new self the same thing as putting on the whole armor of God? I believe it is. Both of these are simply calls to light, calls to live in the light of the gospel. The former may focus more on walking a new path in spite of old temptations, while the latter emphasizes standing firm in our newness and the fact of these enemy attacks. So why highlight all these verses from chapters one through four? It's because they demonstrate how Paul is not doing something new here. In six verses 10 through 17, the imagery is new, but the pastoral message is not our protection in the daily battles. In the midst of trials and temptations, our protection in face of numerous and powerful spiritual enemies is the strong armor of Christ's powerful victory over sin and death. When we are wrapped up and encased in those realities, we are indeed strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. As Paul asks in Romans 8 verse 3, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? So armor up. What battles are you fighting this morning? What battles are there on the horizon? In light of of God's word to us this morning, I hope you will do two things in light of those battles. First, I pray that you, no matter the battle, will recognize how larger forces are always at work, behind the scenes, seeking to move you away from the gospel. That hard situation at work, the medical scare, the rift in your family, those financial pressures, that battle with depression and or anxiety, those challenges with your kids, that addictive behavior, the ultimate goal in all of it. The point of the enemy's scheme is to push you toward distraction and doubt and despair in terms of your faith. It's easy to fixate on the flesh and blood of our struggles, that person, that situation, those feelings that hurt. But when we do that, we often fight using flesh and blood, flesh and blood strategies. So please take a moment to consider what is really happening in that battle. And second, as you recognize that I pray you in response, will put on the armor of God by rehearsing, embracing, and applying the powerful truths of the gospel. When the enemy launches a flaming dart that says, you're a loser, raise up that shield of faith and proclaim, no, I am loved. When that darkness tries to attack you and your past sins, wear that helmet of salvation confidently, knowing that you are forgiven because Christ was forsaken in your place. When those spiritual forces of evil try to undercut you and make you doubt God's favor and presence, wield the sword of the Spirit and declare, God has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And when they attempt to divide us, let the gospel of peace ready your feet 
so that we move closer together instead as one body in Christ. And when they attempt to stab us with worldly and fleshly temptations, let us take the comfort in the breastplate of the righteousness, knowing that we have been redeemed for a new life of humility, purity, and love. Brother and sisters, friends, <clears throat> Jesus Christ rose. Jesus Christ died and rose again. And in doing so, forged an armor stronger than anything this world could offer, unrivaled protection, incomparable safety, Though we might suffer temporary wounds, this armor perfectly and always ensures our ultimate safety in God. And with God forever, and that promise should strengthen us in the midst of any battle. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And now... Is that our hymn of... Uh... So now at this time, we will have sharing the peace because we all need to greet each other and tell how thankful we are we live in this part of the country where we seldom have a hurricane or a tornado and remember all those people who have been affected this year. So this share of the peace. Now, will the ushers come forward, please? Now, if you join me in an offertory prayer, Almighty God, 
giver of every good and perfect gift, teach us to render to you all that we have and all that we are, that we may praise you, not with our lips only, but with our whole lives, turning the duties, the sorrows, and the joys of our days into a living sacrifice to our Savior, Jesus, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, if you remain standing as we sing our hymn of sending, God of grace and God of glory, found on page 577 in the hymnal and on the screen. Blessing and dismissal. In all you do, have faith. In all you say and think and feel, have faith. Living in faith works on all levels, from the spiritual to the physical to the mental. Have faith in goodness, in light, and in love. Let it permeate every cell of your being. Then go out in the world and spread that goodness, that light, and that love. Be faith in human form. Amen. <clears throat>